Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 through 14. Be on your guard, stand firm in faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. I think I do that. I look out to see who's here. Uh, I believe that God helps me uh, throughout the message when I can remember who's here. Uh, to be a little bit more sensitive or to think to say things that I might neglect to say otherwise. So whenever I give you eye contact and then something happens in the message that you think is for you, it, it might be. It m- might, be that, might be that that's what's happening. Um, so uh, I told my dad earlier this week, I was talking to him, and I said, this sermon's a really easy one. You, heard, you saw the scripture reading, right? How could you have any trouble with that? Um, that's pretty easy. Sometimes the easier the text, the tougher it is. You go, well, what am I going to do with that? Um, so truly, uh, every week uh, when I teach or, or preach, I, I, I ask the Lord to provide the message. And when I'm faithful, he does that. And when I'm not, uh, I do something. And it's usually not nearly as effective. Um, and so at the end of the First Corinthians letter, we have this passage, and it's kind of a charge to God's people. And he gives them these very simple instructions that we just heard read to us. Um, I want to use a, a, a brief video. It's about seven minutes. It's a little story that I have referenced before in sermons, um, but it's being told by those who lived it. So that seven minutes, I just want to kind of use it to give us some food for thought for the commands that we were just given from God's word. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to have us watch that message, and then we'll have a few thoughts. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to share one more time. Um, And I pray, Father, that maybe it's not the last time uh, that I get to share with with these brothers and sisters, but it certainly is the only time that this precise group of people will be gathered together to hear this precise message. And I just pray, Father, that you will bless it um, by preparing our hearts, by moving your spirit in and among us, and by waging war Father, for our hearts and minds through your word today. And so we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, that's not what's supposed to happen. I I go through these every Sunday morning, and they work perfectly. Aiden, do you think you can play that video? not giving you the option. This happened the first sermon I preached here. And I took it as a cue not to do it. Do the same thing. Um, I don't want to retell the story either, though. So I'm not going to. Um, Scripture starts out with, be on your guard. And we don't have to you probably don't even need me to say anything else. When you see a lion, what do you immediately think of? What do you think of? Run? Satan? I heard heard somebody say Satan. No, we know we're looking at scripture, so if you've ever lived somewhere where there are lions, right, or or been to a zoo where one was loose, which anymore, it's hard, it's actually something you would think about. You know, there's been these, these awful things happening. Um, in zoos and Disney World. And, uh, but normally we think of scripture and lion, we think of Satan, right? If you're a Narnia fan, you might think of Jesus. <laughs> kind of a weird thing uh, that, that C.S. Lewis has us thinking of, of. But that line would have a nice mane. Notice I chose one that didn't. Um, and so be on your guard. What was the letter to the Corinthians really getting at? So much of it was about division, so much was about false teachings, false ideas, so much of it was about human wisdom and and, and to instead live by the Spirit. And so he's given them a lot of admonishments and commands, and he says, I want you to be on your guard. In his very last remarks of the letter, other than personal comments made to different people, he says, I want you to be on your guard. And I think that this is something that applies to us so profoundly similarly because what had happened with the church in Corinth is they'd gotten so comfortable in the culture they were living in that they were even allowing someone to sleep with, have a sexual relationship 
with his father's wife, and they were cool with it. In fact, some of them were kind of, it sounds like they were even bragging or boasting about something related to the situation. They had kind of like that, you know, proverbial story about getting slow cooked in a pot, right? You don't notice the temperature going up. And, and that was what had happened, perhaps, for these Christians in Corinth. And I think that we're quite comfortable in the pot that we're sitting in sometimes. And so we're not on our guard. We're very unguarded. Because it's kind of like the kids I used to teach in school. They'd tell me that a movie was good or a song was good because it mentioned God. Or it didn't have certain words in it. And certain sins weren't like publicly displayed in all their lewdness. So they'd say, in fact, some of them would say, I think it's a Christian movie. <laughs> it's good. Because there's an absence of bad language and there's an absence of certain sins and so forth. I think what we do sometimes is we get comfortable with that definition of being the church. If it's kind of clean, right, on the outside, then we're not on our guard. It's only if something really, you know, obvious happens. We commit some really awful sin kind of publicly that it gets our attention. But we're not on our guard day in and day out. We live as if there's nothing to be on our guard about. Um, and so you've heard preachers talk before about if we knew there was a lion loose in the building, how would you be behaving? Right? It wouldn't look like this. Right? It, would it? It wouldn't look like this at all. We, it, it would be kind of like, first it would be chaotic, and then someone would rise into leadership, and then we would all like, get calm and figure out what to do. But this is how we kind of live. We live like there's not a lion loose in the building, and there is. And there's a lion loose in this building. And there was a lion loose in the building, they didn't have a building like we do, in Corinth. And he says, be on your guard. You've had problems with sexual immorality. You've had problems with division. You've had problems with egos getting too big. You've had problems with people being worshipped rather than me. You've had problems with not listening to the Spirit. And he says, I want you to be on your guard because there's someone, there's an enemy, who's on the attack. Um, they're telling me they got this video ready, and I'm, I'm still going to skip it despite how much I appreciate them figuring it out. because. Oh, but now I can't go forward at all, so I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. <laughs> um, so I'm not worried about it. All right, here we go. So the scripture is from, is from 1 Peter. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Lisa uh, Jordan mentioned something in class this morning. I don't remember what it was in reference to, but Lisa, you said that uh, you know, there's, there's struggling against sin, and then there's just stopping the struggle and just living willfully in sin. You know? And he says, I want you to resist. When the, when the lion is coming around looking to devour us, it's enticing. That's where the analogy or the metaphor might break down for us a little bit. Unless I think about my family in Yellowstone. Because when we were in Yellowstone, there was a mother grizzly with her cubs. Right? What are you supposed to do when you see that? Keep your distance. In fact, go the other direction. But if you've ever been to Yellowstone, how many have been to Yellowstone before? Ever been the week of the 4th of July? Don't go then. Traffic is insane. But it also means you don't miss any wildlife. Because anytime there's something to see, what is the traffic? Everybody stops, pulls over, everything, and they get out with their cameras. And so this was happening, and you get to where you disregard it because you're like, yeah, it's another bison or whatever. Well, there was a, a grizzly with her cubs. The cubs were up in a tree, and the mother was foraging around. How many of you would like to see that up close? Like, I really want to see that up close. And I'm faster and in better shape than most of the people who were standing on the shoulder close to this mother, right? So it felt very safe for me to get out with my camera and to get among them because surely the bear's not going to pick me or catch me, right? There's a lot of fresh meat here that's probably going to get... I wasn't scared at all, but I was enticed by this thing and I went closer, right? And that's kind of how, you know, I imagine I would be if I saw a lion 
you know, on Safari. Maybe Dave has seen one. Have you seen one? No? Oh, man. I had you up here. Now you're like, <laughs> I thought you'd, he was going to say, yeah, I wrestled one, you know. But, but yeah. I, you know, this is kind of how I would treat the situation with a lion, I'm sure. If I couldn't quite make it out or get the picture, right, I would get closer. If I were Dave, I'd have a gun. I'd be like, you know, looking to do something. But I, 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 can't, I can't imagine that I would keep my distance. Um, I would probably be on my guard while hiking in that area, alert that they exist. But there's something enticing about some risks. There's something that is alluring. And sometimes we, we play that way in the church. Gossip is like one of those things. It's so, so alluring, you know? The, the, the serving thing is pulled down in the kitchen, the doors are shut, and it's just the two of us, and there's something juicy, right? Kitchen's a great place for that, you know? Sitting around a table, praying, taking prayer requests, and we can kind of indulge. And it's, we get close to it. We know it's dangerous. We know it's terrible. It's destructive. It's divisive. It's, but it's just something enticing. And he says, you need to remember the power of sin. You need to remember the power that is there to take you completely off course and to bring shame to the kingdom. Next slide, since I don't think this is going to work. I think it might be that the, uh, something with the mouse up there, but. So be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith is the next part of it. So standing firm in the faith, this made me think of Psalm 1. Uh, do you remember Psalm 1? It talks about being planted near streams of water and uh, this strong tree with these big mature roots located right there by a source of water that perhaps is constant, never fails. Like the water that Jesus offered the woman at the well. You remember that? He said, you're getting water here, you're going to be thirsty soon, but I can give you water that will last forever. I want us to look at Psalm 1, and uh, I, I don't know it by heart, so and I didn't bring my Bible. There we go. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, some versions say in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. The person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. So first, be alert. Second, stand firm in the faith. It's one of the things that Peter wrote in that last passage. He said, be alert, be paying attention. The devil's prowling around. Stand firm in the faith. And then in this passage, Paul says, after saying, be alert, stand firm in the faith. And there's this implication that standing firm to the psalmist means devouring and savoring truth. Not spending time bathing ourselves in the way that the world thinks. And I haven't preached any of those sermons while I've been here about the media, you know, and what you watch on TV, and what movies you're seeing, and what music you're listening to, and what friends you have, and so forth. It just hasn't been something that's been a part of the texts we've been studying. So this is my chance to indulge, right? Because I haven't been spending that time Listen, the company we keep is powerful. Don't the scriptures talk about the company we keep? I preferred sitting in the council of the wicked to, uh, you know, this, this translation here, walking in step with the wicked. But walking in step with the wicked, because it, it sounds like, well, none of us would do that, right? Walk in step with the wicked in unison with them, synchronized with the wicked. But we might sit in a council of the wicked on a regular basis, uh, finding wisdom where there's nothing but foolishness, not being in the word enough to know the difference. As an older Christian, you can sometimes hear younger Christians talking about something that sounds like wisdom but is a lie. Have you ever experienced that? Sometimes you hear older Christians saying the same things. All of us at times fall for that. 
because we're so good and Satan is so good at helping us rationalize sin and making it wise, right? And so we have this problem where we don't get into the word enough to allow the Holy Spirit to say, use this one in this situation, Paul. Use this one in this situation. This word speaks to this situation. Have you had the experience where the word of God comes in like a lightning bolt into the quagmire that you're in and you go, whoa, that brings clarity. That only happens when we spend time in the word. It only happens when we devour it. I had a few stages in my life where I devoured the word. There were stages I went through. I don't devour it on a regular basis in this phase of my life, which is bizarre because that's what I'm here to do, right? Do you picture me in the office devouring the word like all day long? Because that's not what I do. But there were times in my life where I devoured it. And one of those was in college, my sophomore year of college. I just went nuts. Just couldn't get enough of the Bible. One was my sophomore year in high school. I couldn't get enough of it. I would retire to my room and read and take notes and underline and circle. And, and you know, to this day, those passages that I discovered, my kids will sometimes say to me, how do you know so many verses? You know, I, I memorized a few when I was little, but what really happened was that I started getting into the Word. I didn't intend to memorize anything. All of a sudden, something comes up, and I'm like, bam, there's something for that. And I've got it. Whether I have it word for word or not, I've got some of them. I've got so many in me that now I can go to the concordance and I can find any, or Google, and I can find any verse I want to find. Right? Can you do that? Have you had that experience? Because there's enough of it in you that you have these roots and you stand firm and whatever storm comes, we're driving back. Uh, we, we had gone to try to finalize something on the house and um, get the kids to take a look at school and you know sports and stuff like that and I'm really having a hard time with the house situation and I'm, so I'm preaching out loud in the car and I say to Sherry I'm not preaching at you I'm preaching at me like and I'm reminding myself of biblical truths because there's these lies coming at me there's these insecurities there's these fears of things that aren't from God and they're, they're rooted in idolatry, and I'm seeing it in myself. I'm seeing myself lose sight of the truth. And the Holy Spirit says, there's this scripture, there's that scripture, there's this scripture. And my roots, you know, held me, and I started to feel strong in the midst of the storm of emotions and mixed feelings. And I didn't believe all, I mean, like, I didn't feel totally at peace, but I could see clearly. You ever had that situation? You don't feel totally at peace, but you know? You at least know, and there's a certain piece that comes from knowing what's true. Even if you can't quite believe it at the moment, you believe it enough, and it's enough to hold you. The psalmist says, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. Once had a friend, still a very dear friend, actually. Um, he wasn't a Christian at the time, and we were out for a, a run, and he said, you know, I, I like hanging out with you because I had this one pastor friend, and I wasn't a minister at the time, but he kind of equated me with that. And he said, I had this one pastor friend, and all he ever did was talk about Jesus. It was like it was all he cared about. I just got tired of it. I mean, like, that's great. Jesus is great, but all the time? Don't you like anything else? And uh, I'm running, and I'm going, oh, note to self, don't talk about Jesus too much. Right? Not because I didn't, I didn't want to, like, I didn't care about irritating him. I wanted him to love Jesus. And I didn't want to, like, go about it the wrong way, you know? Um, and, but that was, that, was kind of, that was kind of the way I felt, though. Immediately I thought about my life and, and what I'm always talking about and what I really care about. And I was like, I don't know how to talk about anything else. Isn't, isn't everything about Jesus? Isn't, isn't it true that the long-run relationship with him, there's nothing that's not about him? And so my apologies to the young people who I've irritated in my life, you know, especially, and um, my family, if, if something becomes about Jesus, and it's like, how did we get here? You know, it's what I enjoy about being in a Christian school is that uh, teachers sometimes forget everything's about Jesus. And, and, and it's like, wait a minute, you guys, you could make everything about Jesus because it is, no matter what content you teach. And we realize that's what life is like because we just, we just 
we devour and we find that it's a part of us and it touches everything. He says, stand firm in the faith, which means staying in the word, devouring it, letting it become a part of you so that everything that you see, every conflict you're in, you begin to see what it is that God might be about in that situation. It's no longer about me and this person. There's something greater going on. Standing firm in the faith will hold you in those times. He says, be on your guard, stand firm, be courageous. Do you remember when this was? We know the place, Tiananmen Square. Some of you may not know the place because you may not have seen it in the news and it was a passing note maybe in history. Well, it was 1989. Um, and I remember this from then. I didn't care about it too much. I was too young to really care about it. The world revolved around me. <laughs> so, um, but what, what an incredible picture that captured something that was a part of that populist movement that was happening in China at the time, where people were fighting for ideals. They weren't physically fighting. They were standing. There was a starvation thing going on, a protest. Uh, there were people doing peaceful demonstrations. And, and the government felt threatened, even though there wasn't violence going on. They felt threatened by the stand that was being taken for something that I believe the government knew was bigger than them and that they couldn't control. In this case, it was freedom. It was the dignity and worth of a human being and so forth. These are things that our founding fathers said are inalienable rights. That's a big statement. And so the government in China at the time, they certainly recognized, as has every totalitarian dictatorship, that there's something bigger than us at work, and the only way to control it is with violence and fear. Because the power behind it and the truth behind it is undeniably bigger. So they go at, at, at these students, you know, in this case with tanks and whatnot, who are peacefully demonstrating. Because the truth is powerful. And it's frightening to the liars, isn't it? And so this picture conjures up for me, though this wasn't some kind of Christian demonstration, right? It conjures up for me what it is to be courageous as the church, and that is to stand in front of the enemy or an oppressive idea or an oppressive regime of any kind, spiritually, physical, otherwise, and to know that right behind that fourth tank is the God of the universe, right? I remember from the movie, uh, one of the Lord of the Rings movies, The Two Towers. Any of you Lord of the Rings people? Because I've referenced it a few times. Lord of the Rings, a few? Okay, it's the people I thought it would be. Um, whatever that means. Um, take that how you will. There's, there's this scene where uh, at, they're at Helm's Deep, you know, it's, and they're kind of all the good guys, basically, if you don't know anything about it, all the good guys are in, retre like, retreated. They're in a hole, you know, this fortress this iron fortress in the, in the mountains. And they're, they're like, basically, they've, they have no hope. They just got to sit there and starve, probably, or, or until finally the enemy breaks through. And they're terribly outnumbered and so forth. Um, but Gandalf, the, the good wizard, you know, he, he comes up over the horizon. And in the movie, uh, you know, as soon as he comes, it's like, you know that like everyone's courage is going to be revived and this, you, there's the sun's coming up and you know, have you remember that scene? Have you seen it? Yeah, it's a great scene and I can't help but think of, the, of Jesus on the white horse and so forth. Like, I can't help, the, the books are like that. You can't help but get these spiritual visions as, you, as you're reading through it. Um, but there's this, there's this sense in which uh, we forget what the truth is and as a church we lack courage. Um, there was never any doubt who was going to win that. If you're reading the text, and in the movie you might have doubt if you never read the books, but if you're reading the books, and you, you know. You just, there's this sense of this overarching power for good and truth that's going to win. And you kind of know that, even in your darkest moment as a believer, that whatever's happening, there is a good ending to this story. And I couldn't help but listen this morning to to all of the things going on. It's been a dreadful week in the news, hasn't it? More importantly, it's been a dreadful week in the lives of real people who are like you and me. And, and the families that are going through the trials that they're going through now, the kind of week Vanessa's had, you know, and her family. There is the, the kind of week they've had on Becky Street. You know, where'd Becky go? She had to take the kids. 
And, and I get sick of it. I was talking to the pizza guy last night. I got pizza last night, and the owner's a believer, and, and one of his employees overdosed and died uh, on Friday night. So we were talking um, yesterday about how tired we are of all of it, you know? It just seems like it's only going in one direction, right? Everything's going south, including the fishers. And <laughs> Memphis, again, no offense to Greg, but still. And Kim, I think. Is she here this morning? No. This is what, this is what I'm reminded of, because sometimes it's, it's literally life can get so difficult, this is the only thing that, that keeps you going. It's the resurrection, right? The video that I didn't show you, because it turns out my sermon was going to be long if I had the video, I didn't know that. Um, it, it's the story of resurrection, and I'm, I've told you before, read the book. It's called Through the Gates of Splendor. Read it, Through the Gates of Splendor. None of you are writing it down. You're not going to remember it. It's called Through the Gates of Splendor. Um, and Elizabeth Elliot wrote it. And I've told you, it's about those missionaries who went to Ecuador. But this video has the, the man that... Uh, Steve Saint, now a grown man and a grandfather, calls his grandfather. Steve Saint is there with his Aboriginal grandfather. Steve Saint is from the States. He's not from Ecuador. But the man he calls his grandfather is the murderer of his father. And he is his father figure in his life because of the gospel, because of resurrection, because we serve a redeemer who's alive and keeps working on resurrection in our lives, in our relationships, in our communities, in our church. And he, these were people, these five missionary men who died, who when you read their journals and their letters and you understand where their faith was, um, you recognize that they weren't heroes. They were just what Christians are supposed to be. Um, we named one of the houses up at Coventry Christian. We went to a house system after Elizabeth Elliot, who was one of the missionaries' wives, and then became the, one of the ladies who went back and preached the gospel to the murderers of their husbands. Yeah, your son was in Elliot House. He was a student dean, student leader. That's great. Cool. Um, so I was listening to Elizabeth Elliot reading her own book uh, the other day, and it was, a, it was a book about Jim, her husband's life. And she said, Jim didn't want to be known as a hero, and not really even as a martyr. He's just a disciple. And, and what he did is what every disciple is supposed to do. right? But he was so convinced of the resurrection that it defined everything for him. Paul wrote this, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with, the immor with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We're told not to grow weary of doing good. But isn't it typical for us to experience that in our relationships, which is primarily where good and evil is done, God defines good and evil by how we treat each other, right? M morality is all about relationship. In our relationships with each other, we've all experienced that point where we say, this isn't paying off. I've extended too much grace and now I'm getting hurt. You know, and I always have to throw in the caveat, it's not right to be in an abusive situation and to not seek help. None of us deserves to be abused by another human being. Most of us aren't in that situation. Most of us are dealing with situations where we've tried to be the good person and then we say, this is in vain. And we walk out because it's not working. It's not working. Well, it didn't work really well when the five missionaries finally made personal contact and all got speared to death. And the wives could have said, well, this isn't working. All the old people who told us we shouldn't do this mission work were right. 
If you look up on Google or YouTube, you can look up Godly Women series and you'll see one where the wives are all talking in their own voices about why, what they were feeling. It's real, it's honest. The anger, the loss, the betrayal by God that they felt. And then they felt called to go love the people who killed their husbands. Because for them, the labor in the Lord is never in vain. They read these truths, and it's so inspiring to hear them do this. They talk about the scriptures that informed their decisions, right? So the standing firm was about being deeply rooted in the truth of scripture so that God, by his spirit, will use it when the need to become courageous presents itself. But you don't become courageous by reading a verse about be courageous. Okay, I think I'll do that. I think I'll just be courageous. Tomorrow I'm going to start being courageous. It's not, it's not a decision you make. You do make decisions to get in the Word. You do make decisions to trust God with small things that you're not trusting Him with today. And then, when the need for real courage arises, He will have built a man or a woman out of you. And you will be courageous. This I remember. Death has no victory. Death has no sting. Death in all its forms. Physical death. Death of relationships. Death of my hope in something that disappointed me. None of it has victory. None of it gets to sting me. None of it. Be courageous. Be strong. I love this picture. I don't have the whole thing because it's too big. But be strong. Do these guys feel strong? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> How do we become strong? How does it work? Just with muscles. Exercise. What does exercise do to you? It adds stress. It hurts. And sometimes, all the time, if you actually do it, like to the point where you're supposed to, it breaks you down a little bit. Right? If you study the physiology of muscles, they can't get bigger or stronger unless you tear some muscle fibers first. Not the actual whole fiber. There's little fibers within the fibers. There's little tiny ones. Don't tear the big ones, right? And there's these myofibrils inside of there. If you tear those things, you get stronger. Anyone who's not willing to suffer will not get stronger, right? These guys feel weak. The guys behind them look great. I don't know what's going on with the, the two in the front, but... You have to go through experiences of tremendous weakness in order to be strong. And what we do when we come to Christ is we so often decide that we're going to come to Christ so that we don't have to have pain, so that we don't have to suffer, so that we can have the life that all these Christians say we're going to have. You follow Christ, then he takes care of everything. And so we jump in. We're like, I'm in for that. This sounds better than what I got. This was God's word for the Apostle Paul when he said, I have these issues in my life that are plaguing me. We don't know exactly what. One of them that he mentions is a messenger from Satan that's tormenting him. But God said to him, when he wouldn't remove the difficulty, God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Since it's a theme of my life, I know I've preached it before, but I'll bring it up in this sermon again. The, the workout that I hate the most in running workouts is hill workouts. I hate hill workouts. I hate them with a passion. Isaiah's smiling at me. He wasn't ever really a fan of hill workouts either, I don't think. But you know, we trained together for a 15K that was a trail run in, in the mountains on hiking trail. And there was one big hill that I kept telling him about. And you do hill workouts to work on your lactic acid threshold. So when your muscles, you know, you feel the burn, right? Not, not him, the actual burn, like from exercise, not Bernie. When you... When you 
create a tolerance for it by doing hill workouts, you're stronger whether you're on a hill or not. You can handle the burn, and you don't burn as quickly, right? You can push harder before the burn sets in. We were, uh, we were doing hill workouts, really intense ones, that most people would have said, that's too much, you don't need to do that much. But when we got in the race, we hated Tuesdays, because Tuesdays were hill, hill days, right? It's Tuesday. Ugh. We were passing, nobody passed us on the hill, did they? Nobody. It was a mountain, really. But nobody passed us on it. We picked off one person after another going up that thing. And he looked strong. I felt terrible. I was behind, was I behind you? I think I was behind him most of the way up. And then when I was in front of him, I was like, he's on my heels, he's on my heels. And I had to keep pushing. But he said to me halfway up, I think he said, I love Tuesdays. Or he said something about loving the, I think he said, I love Tuesdays. Yeah. So um, and as, a, as a coach, I was like, yes, right? Yes. Because in life, as a father, I was thinking, I want my children to embrace difficulty. I don't want them to make safe decisions all the time. I don't want them to just be comfortable. Yes, yes. I don't want you to just be comfortable. I knew it would come sometime today. I'm going to get emotional. I don't want this church to be comfortable. And I know I can't be a part of whatever's next directly. But every week I want you uncomfortable. And I hope you have felt that in the sermons. Because, folks, the church cannot be what God's called us to be if we're going to be comfortable. We cannot stay comfortable. Do not stay comfortable. He says, I delight in these things. And we read it and we go, what a hero of the faith. There is no in indication in this text that he's saying this is for a special class of Christian. This is for all of us. Because when we're weak, that's when God demonstrates his power. That's when big things happen. When something difficult happens, just like when I run up a good hill and I, I hate the hill and I want to say I hate this hill. I say, this is a good hill. When a workout is terrible and I feel awful, like I want to vomit, I go, that was a great workout. Because what is it earning for us? What is it earning for us? And whatever we're looking at as a church or you are in your life that's difficult right now, I can't with any credibility, if I haven't experienced it, say to you, hey, I know what you're feeling, because I don't. But I can say I know what the truth is, the truth is that this will be for your benefit and God's glory, and he will demonstrate his power if you will submit to him in your weakness. So we're told to be strong. And finally, last point, do everything in love. Do everything in love. This is Minkai. The man on the left is Minkai. He is the murderer of Steve's father, Nate Saint. Steve... Um, loves Minkai, his family, right? And he was talking about Father's Day uh, in, in a video that I had seen and how much he longed to see his father and how much he ached for his father growing up. And Minkai had come back to the States to visit them and their, and their family and his surrogate grandchildren. And uh, Steve had gone to bed and his wife said to him, uh, you just want to go back in and check on him or give him another kiss, don't you? Minkai, not his kids, but his grandfather, the murderer of his father. And he realized in that moment that God had given him a father in Minkai, in the man who killed his father. And he even said, you know, when, when they went back with his mother to reach these folks who had killed their family, <laughs> Minkai said to Steve's mother, said, hey, your son doesn't know how to do anything. He doesn't know how to fish. He can't make an arrowhead for his spear or whatever. He, can't. He, can't, he doesn't know how to do anything a man needs to know how to do. What's wrong with him? And she, and she looked at him and she said, oh, he said, who's going to teach him? And she looked at him and she said, well, you took his father. Don't you think you might qualify for or responsible for that job? And he said, yes. I think that's my job now. Now, he'd already been, become a Christian, right, when he was making these observations. In fact, I think she had baptized him. 
And so at, from that point, he was eight years old, Steve was when that happened, uh, Ming Kai became his father, his grandfather, and his mentor. And spiritually, he attributes Ming Kai for having taught him how to be a disciple of Christ. This is a story that we read and we say, this is impossible. This kind of thing happens like once a century in the kingdom. And what God is saying to us is, no, this is the kind of thing that happens all the time in the kingdom. If you'll just say yes to what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to do my command. Remain in me. This is my command. Jesus, in, in the time that Mark was talking about before communion, he, he has this tremendous, the Gospel of John's my favorite because there's this long section of red letters where Jesus goes on for quite some time, pretty much uninterrupted. And uh, he says in that text, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Love each other. And it's interesting, he says, there's no greater thing that a friend can do, no greater love than if a friend lays down his life for another. And he says, you are my friends. What does he mean by that? <laughs> Lay down your lives for me. I always read that and I went, yeah, if I ever had to do that, that would show what a friend I was. And I never read it and went, Jesus is telling me to lay down my life. But he says, you're my friends. Let me show you how. I've told you everything the Father's shown me. You're not my servants. You're my friends. I want you to love me. I want you to love each other. The end result of that, the calling is that I will lay down my life for my Lord. It's not mine. I want to share something personal with you that I've, I've, I've wanted you to believe. But I don't know that I could ever convince you, and I'm hoping that I, this will convince you. That I had this conversation with my wife. I said... Um, I was talking about, we made that road trip to Memphis. I was driving back into Pennsylvania, and I was crying. My family wasn't seeing it. There were tears coming down. I was like, oh, boy, let's get those off before anyone sees them. And I said, like, I don't remember exactly my words, but I said, she said something to me. Well, this was your choice. <laughs> I've heard that a few times. <laughs> and I thought it was ours, but... Um, and I said, I said, it's not really. It's not really. And then I said, I've never gotten to make a choice about my career that's been mine. You know? And I'm thankful for that. I'm glad for that. Sort of. <laughs> I want to get to make all those choices. You know? But there have been so many times in my life where, and I know you've experienced this because you're brothers and sisters. You've experienced it. Where you just, you knew that this wasn't your choice. You had to do something, and you may have even wanted to do it. That's great. But so much of the time, I've known the Lord's will because it's been the thing that I resist. You know? And the change in our family's life is one of those. I've resisted it, and I've resisted it, and it became clear it's what I was called to do. And in doing so, um, I have visited pain upon myself and my family, and brothers and sisters. And yet, these are the kinds of truths that I believe inform that decision and others that you all need to make in your lives right now. To be courageous, to be strong, to do things that you're doing out of love. I think I've shared with you before that my prayers to the Lord have been that he, because deciphering his will is so difficult, isn't it? Like, how do we know what God's will is? And the words in Scripture just don't give you everything you need to answer that question for every challenge in life. 
And I've gotten to the point where I've just prayed, Lord, show me my motives so that I would know whether I'm doing something that is your will. Because the one thing we know is the Lord wants us to do everything in love. He wants us to do everything in faith. Anything not done in faith is sin, Paul writes. So that means that I want to ask the Lord, wherever I'm at and your situation is different than mine, but it's the same principle. The prayer is, Lord, show me my motives because I know that, as we talked about in class, you're looking at my heart. And there is no decision that is insignificant, too insignificant, to ask God to show you that. His will is that your heart would be pure, that you would do everything in love. If that's your motive, then the good thing that you're doing is God's will. But you can do all kinds of good things that aren't done in love and they will become destructive. Do everything in love. Many of you are serving in the church in powerful ways. You're knocking a bunch of stuff off the checklist and everyone feels relieved that you're doing it. But if you take on any of those tasks for something other than love, if it's to affirm yourself so that you know that you're good enough or worth it, to earn some kind of forgiveness or pleasure from God, if it's to make a name for yourself, if it's, I don't know what it is, if there's anything motivating us other than love, guess what the end result will be? It'll be division like they had in Corinth. It'll be that we start looking to people rather than God, that we disregard the Holy Spirit and listen to our flesh. Those are the things that will happen. So when Paul says in this lesson, be on your guard, he's saying, understand that the enemy is real, he's in everything, and he's looking to trip us up. Don't ever assume that the person in the pew across from you is the enemy. Don't ever assume that the person in your office who's in the world is the enemy. The enemy doesn't present himself so clearly. He does it subtly, and he likes to make us think it's you or you or you. He doesn't want us to know who's behind monkey with things. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Get into the word. Let it inform your spirit. Let it inform your mind. Be courageous. Remember that we live in a resurrection time. Anything that we face now is short, it's temporary, and it's followed by guaranteed glory. Period. Period. Do you remember, this is the same letter that he went on and on and on and on for like 60 verses about the importance of the resurrection and the way that we orient ourselves. Be strong. And the Apostle Paul knew that that meant be weak, be humble, be the one who lays his life down, who doesn't hold on to it. Be the one who says, I'm sorry first. Be the one who is viewed as less than. Be that person and you will be strong. And then do everything in love. Everything in love. If love's not motivating it, it's not faith. It's not faith. And anything not done in faith is sin. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. Let me pray for us, and then we'll have a song. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to share this charge that the Apostle Paul gave your church in Corinth. And Father, it's a real church with real people, just like this one here, living in a culture very much like ours. And we don't want to be complacent, Father. We don't want to lose that sense of urgency. Convict us of the reality of the spiritual war that we're in. And cultivate in us by your spirit a genuine love for one another. And Father, we ask you to remove the spirit of judgment and criticism that divides your people. Yes, yes. When we assume things about others' motives without grace. Yes. When we talk and, and we gossip and we call it prayer. Father, we're, we're so guilty of so many of these sins that were in Corinth. Yes, I know there's sexual immorality, Father. I know there is. And I ask that you would remove the fear of confession from us. 
that whatever the struggles are, Father, that we saw in your church in Corinth, that you would convict us and move us, Father, to do something to move in your direction, to receive your grace and the power that's found in the weakness of admitting that we are broken and that we need help. Father, make us strong, make us courageous. Help us to always fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, that we would scorn the shame of whatever it is that would keep us from being pure in heart before you. And Father, we ask that you would, in all things, guard our motives and cultivate in us a genuine love for you and for each other so that when we act and when we work and we serve here, it would indeed bring glory to you, that people would see you and not us. Lord, make us smaller, that you might be greater. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.